This lesson this uh, evening is directed toward, of course, everyone here, but I specifically am directing it to those who are not members of the Church of Christ, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament, and the church to which the Lord added those who were baptized for the remission of sins in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, 41, 42, and 47. I'm specifically wanting them to understand what we're going to talk about tonight. But also to those who are new Christians, they need to be reminded of what they did in becoming Christians, to be encouraged to rejoice in the promises that they have. And to those who have been Christians many years, to be able to thank God for this blessing and to realize the way to become a Christian and when one becomes a Christian and so many other things is a blessing from God or blessings from God. So open your New Testaments to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Colossians 1, 12 through 14. Herein, the inspired apostle Paul speaks of five, five things for which Christians are to be thankful. And in seeing what we're to be thankful for, I wanted to impress upon those who have not been baptized for the remission of sin to realize that it is a blessing to have the Bible that teaches us what to do to be saved from our sins. And for those, as I said earlier, who have obeyed the gospel by being baptized to Christ, they'll be reminded of these blessings regardless of how long they've been in the church. We cited in it by introduction, by introduction in Ephesians 5 and verse 20, where Paul wrote, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I will mention here, I will be using the new King James Version most of the time. But then again, another passage from Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18, where he wrote, in everything give thanks. Well, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So we're talking about thanking God for his blessings, the three different categories that I've mentioned. Now, for the remainder of this study, we will briefly note five, five spiritual blessings that all of us need to realize need to understand as to why we should be thankful. And I think just studying them causes us to see why we should be thankful to God for them. First of all, we ought to thank God because he allows sinful people, people caught up in sin, people separated from him by their sins to qualify themselves so that heaven can be their home when they die and the world ends. Paul wrote in Colossians 1.12, saying, giving thanks to the Father. New King James says, has qualified, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of the light. So we're to be thankful to God. We're to be thankful for him that he has qualified us. The old King James says, made us meet. But mean, meet, M-W-E-T, means suitable. God has made us, quali he's qualified us, that is, he's made us suitable to be partar partakers of the inheritance. Now, note 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And herein the apostle teaches that the inheritance that God is going to permit Christians to partake is heaven itself. The passage reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Also notice that 1 Peter 1, verses 22 and 23 teaches that we qualify ourselves to be partakers of heaven. And we do that because we obey the truth. 
and thereby experience a new birth into God's spiritual family, which Paul tells us is the church in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Thus Peter writes, since you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Having read that, let's now go to 1 Peter 3, or rather 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter 3, verses 17 and 18. 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18. The scripture reads, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. Well, I think it's quite obvious we can see the importance of growth that once one's been baptized for the remission of sins, one needs to grow in greater knowledge of what it is to be a Christian, to live like Christ. Now, with what we've studied in mind, read Colossians 1.12, focusing on the last phrase, which is the saints in the light. Again, the New King James rendering. Of course, the word saint means set apart. You can be set apart for any particular thing. In this case, people set apart to serve God. So in the New Testament, the term saints refers to Christians who are set apart from the ways of the world and set apart to live according to the ways of God. Pausing again to what we said in the beginning, isn't it amazing that God has blessed us with a scheme of redemption that allows us and permits us to do that? So members of the Lord's church remain qualified to receive the inheritance of heaven if they live daily that pure and wholesome life, a faithful life in the spiritual body of Christ, which is the church. 1 Corinthians 15 Verse 58, therefore be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Second point of Colossians 1 and the first part of the verse, verse 13, teaches that we ought to thank God that he has delivered us from the power of darkness. We're taught to be thankful in general for all the good things of God. We're taught in Ephesians 1, 3, that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus. But we're looking at specific things here. And to those outside of Christ, outside of the church, not members of the church, lost in sin, it shows you that we have a way to be delivered from this power of darkness. Now, the power of darkness is nothing but the realm of Satan, where he dominates and rules. Darkness implies the absence of light, but much more than that, opposition to the light, opposition to what is true and pure and wholesome as God's will sets it out. Darkness is not only a condition of being without God, but of being opposed to God. People enter the kingdom of darkness when they first choose to sin, to transgress God's law, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. So when one has done that, he's separated from God by that sin. And there's not a thing to do human beings can do in and of themselves to escape the power of darkness. We must depend upon God if there's to be any escape at all. So the inspired apostle Paul wrote, men and women become slaves to sin. We're in bondage to sin. That happens when we sin. Romans 6, verses 16 and 17. Well, of course, sin is, as I said earlier, disobedience to the will of God. I cite again 1 John 3, 4. I can put in here 
uh, James 4, verse 18. So how thankful we are that God has intervened by sending his son who was tempted in every point like as we are, that is tempted, solicited by Satan to sin, to break God's law, yet he's without sin. Thus, he could die on our behalf as sinners. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3. In Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, Apostle Paul teaches that people enter into the kingdom of darkness by their own efforts. In other words, what you choose to do transgresses God's will. Thus, that's how you enter the, the power of darkness or the kingdom of the power of darkness. And the only way out of this cursed conduct and state is by being taught the gospel, God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16. That's why the church is to preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, because in preaching the gospel, you're preaching the power of God to save people. So one must believe it, and one must obey the teachings of Christ and the gospel. The apostle wrote, this is rather lengthy. This is Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. Again, New King James Version. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. You should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds having an understanding dark, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, work all in cleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in the true righteousness and holiness. I might pause here and interject this. We're having a class at the moment on thinking and right thinking. Well, I want you to take note of that particular passage and see if you see a thing in it that might have anything to do with right thinking. Colossians 1.13, the first part of it, and again, the passage we just noted, Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. The apostle is teaching that Christians need to be thankful that God has delivered us from the power of darkness. Now, those outside of Christ, you need to be thankful that you're in a position to hear the gospel, understand it, and know how you can be saved from your sins if you will. So these scriptures teach we've been delivered from the power of Satan. Well, of course, Satan's going to continue to tempt us, that is, solicit us to sin against God. But he does not have the power to make Christians obey him against their will. Christians can and must say no to Satan. It comes down to that. James 4.17 tells us, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I suggest Resisting the devil really has to do with us drawing near to God, which we're told to do. But I don't know another way to do that. And I know his word and obey his commandments, and you'll draw near to him and at the same time be resisting Satan. Third point in Colossians 1.13, and uh, the part, second part of that verse, teaches us to thank God because he has conveyed or, I should say, transferred Christians into the kingdom of God's dear son, or as it said in New King James, the son of his love. I believe it says that in the American Standard 1901 too. You know, those familiar with the Bible, that in Matthew chapter 16, 18 through 19, Matthew, by inspiration, teaches us that the kingdom of Christ, because he records the words of Christ, is the church of Christ and vice versa. Here's how he did it. When the Lord gave his promise to build his church singular, he also spoke of the church as the kingdom, using the two terms interchangeably. The scripture simply reads, and also Peter, uh, Paul, Jesus speaking to Peter, says, and I also say to you that you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys 
Well, the foundation of the church is the truth that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the son of God. Well, that rock, Jesus built the church. But he says keys, he's talking about terms of entrance. You know what a key accomplishes. And so that involves understanding the totality of the New Testament's teaching on obeying the complete plan of salvation. You hear the gospel, you understand it, you believe in Christ on the basis of the testimony in the scriptures, Romans 10, 17. You repent of your sins and obedience to the command of Acts 17, 30. You confess your faith in Christ that he's the son of God, Romans 10, verse 10. And you're baptized as Peter commanded those on the day of Pentecost for the remission of sins by the authority of Christ, Acts 2, verse 38. So notice, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Well, notice I say again, church and kingdom are used interchangeably in that passage. Christ's kingdom, of course, then is not an earthly kingdom. Christ's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom, which will not be destroyed. As Daniel prophesied of in Daniel 2, in verse 44, hundreds of years before Christ walked this earth. The Colossian Christians were in the kingdom of Christ at the time that the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to them. Just here we emphasize that the kingdom or church was established on the first Pentecost, Jewish feast day, following the resurrection of Christ from the dead, Acts 2. Now, that means this, so when Jesus comes a second time, it will be coming to deliver up the kingdom or church to God, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, not to set up a kingdom. And you might take note, nowhere in the New Testament does it ever teach that Christ in his second coming will set foot on this old sin-cursed earth again. Christians today simply are not waiting for Jesus to come and set up an earthly kingdom. That kingdom, the Lord's kingdom, is now in existence and has been for almost 2,000 years. The kingdom of God's dear son, then, is the church. And when one obeys the gospel, God's power to save him from sin, God puts that individual person into the kingdom or church. As you have said, as I referred to earlier, in Acts 2, 47, the second part of it, and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Fourth point that I want to make, is Colossians 1, 14, the first part of the verse. And it teaches us to thank God for making it possible to have redemption through our Lord's shed blood. Colossians 1.14a, in whom we have redemption through his blood. The word redeem means to buy back. Redeemed is the word which was used for the emancipation or setting free of a slave and for the buying back of someone who was in the power of another. Now, I apologize to say to those outside of the church, who's not a, who are not citizens of the kingdom of heaven. You're still a slave to sin. You're not participating in the blessing that God offers you through the plan of salvation to be free from sin. When a baby's born of this world, they're born pure and innocent. They're free from the guilt of sin. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, and verse 16, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? So we learn that when one reaches the age of being accountable to God for his actions, and that person commits sin, then that person becomes a slave to Satan. He's in the power of darkness. He's separated from God thereby. Reading Romans 6, 17, and 18, Paul teaches that once an individual obeys the plan of salvation, or as he says, that form of doctrine, that pattern of teaching, delivered to people in the New Testament in the form of a gospel message, they're set free from the guilt of sin. Paul wrote it, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. If you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. Those who are just new Christians, you're a slave to righteousness. You're a new creature in Christ. You've been added to the church by the Lord. You're to live a righteous life. For those who have not done that, you know now what to do to be saved. But if you don't do it, 
you die lost. There's no hope then. In Romans 6, 3, and 7, Paul teaches that the form of doctrine must be obeyed, as we pointed out. Revelation 1, 5 makes it clear unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So the blood was shed on the cross in Christ's death, and we contact that blood when we're baptized into his death, Romans 6, 3, and 4. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The last point from Colossians 1, 14, the second part of the verse, teaches us to thank God he's made it possible for us to receive forgiveness of sin through Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now, we learn from Romans 6, 23, the first part of the verse, that if we don't receive forgiveness of sins, we are abiding in spiritual death, separated from God, for such death means. That means if we die in that state, it's eternal separation from God. As the passage reads, the wages of sin is death. The Hebrews epistle in chapter 3 and verse 13 tells us, that is speaking to all of us, regardless of how long we've been in the church, and specifically this is addressed to members of the church, but exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is so deceitful that it will make you think nothing bad will ever happen if you remain a sinner. I hope that hits the person who's not a member of the Church of Christ. That's the church Paul was a member of, Peter was a member of, James was a member of. And that's the one we ought to be a member of. And anybody that's a member of a denomination is not a member of the Lord's Church unless they're erring and have left the faith. They need to repent and come back. So we've studied this evening how to be saved by the gospel of Christ. Why we should be thankful as Christians and why those outside of Christ should take advantage of what God has blessed them with in the great plan of salvation. Thank you very much.